beginning with objects again on the file. I've added in one other example under object literal that was not talked about last week. And I feel that it's good to have that, and that is daisy up here. So my daisy example, it's an object literal. And the key thing about daisy is daisy is being defined. So var daisy equals and just an empty set of curly braces to reinforce that daisy is an object. So when we say var something equals and put some curly braces, we're telling JavaScript, I want this to be an object. That's what it does. Then that particular object, we can say, Daisy, your name is Daisy, your weight is 10, your breed is a toy. So all of those things are now accessible to Daisy. It's a longer way, but in some ways, a very direct way of working with it in the same way that we have Fido defined here. Fido, var Fido, but then we put those properties inside the curly braces. Now, the semicolon after the last curly brace on Fido, so you'll see after the curly brace there is a semicolon. It's important that every time you say something is equal to something else, that line of text will end with a semicolon. That's a requirement in the language where if we were to use, say, a function declaration, not a function expression. So remembering that we've had that little discussion on declarations and expressions. So if I were to have something like function Fred, and then within Fred, it would be do something. I do not need a semicolon after the end of that. But if I have var um, shaggy is equal to function do something else. And oh, oh if I put a comment here, um, then I would have to get that on the next line. So I'm going to just do um, so when it's a function, or if we put this onto its own line like this. So when or when it's an expression, expressions always end with a semicolon. But when I have a function declaration, I don't have to have that semicolon. Now, JavaScript is pretty good about doing the automatic semicolon insertion. So if you forget to put your semicolons, typically your code won't break. I will use typically as the operative term there. It's pretty good about it. But if when you are looking at other people's code, trying to integrate samples of code you find from other resources, you will find that sometimes things will have semicolons, sometimes things won't, and you'll be like, well, wait, uh, this after this curly brace, I put one, this one I did, and what's going on? So just trying to clarify that little point. When you have an expression, expressions, an expression is something equal something. That's an expression. It's a statement. And we punctuate a statement like that with a semicolon. So that's part of the language. All right, so after that little diversionary trip, so we can see defining our object literal, daisy is a statement. There's an equal sign in there. So we punctuate it with a semicolon. Fido is an object literal in the same way, but now we're defining all of Fido's properties when we constructed Fido. So we're giving Fido a name, a way to breed and loves. But we can also append Fido after Fido's been created, where we say Fido.h equals three. 
that's very much in the same way that we assigned properties and gave them values to Daisy after the Daisy object was created. So the object literal is used when we are defining an object that we're not going to define this object again. We're not going to have two of these or three of these where we have to essentially do all of the same work. So if we were working with an employee database and defining the employees, if we defined each employee as an object literal, that's probably not a very good use of your skills and talents because the code would be ridiculously repetitive because every employee would have essentially the same object literal definition, which means we probably want to define a prototype prototype object instead of defining each one as a unique object literal. But when we just need one copy of something, this is the fastest and easiest way to do it. But if you are going to need multiple copies of this kind or type of object, then we want to start looking at using a constructor, which we will get to shortly. Now, using these or working with these, it uh, looks like I took out, um, oh, there it is, uh, methods. So we have functions here. So if I have a function and I used a function expression, thus it ends with a semicolon, but in my function expression, lose weight, we can pass to it an object. The object I'm going to pass to it, well, since we're using the mental construct of dog, it makes sense to refer to that as dog, but I could just, it doesn't have to be, it could just be any old thing. And then we're going to tell that object that we want to lower its weight. So we use the minus equals on its weight, and that now affects the weight. So if I were to apply this to Daisy, that means that Daisy would be in a world of hurt because Daisy weighs 10 pounds to begin with and this lose weight function as it's written will always take off 13 pounds which doesn't make it a very flexible kind of function so if I have a function like this where I am modifying a property of an object it often is going to make sense to pass in how much I want to modify that property by as a second parameter. So I'm going to comment out this function, actually all of this, and look at the second lose weight function where it takes two parameters. It takes my object and then it's expecting a quantity. And then we take that object and we modify its weight property by that quantity. So now that way when Daisy's losing weight we can pass in a much healthier weight number say two or even one because we don't want Daisy to become too skinny at that point. Otherwise that would be bad for our little toy dog because uh, we don't want to send it into a negative quantity. Of course now Fido could lose 18 pounds, but if I were to pass that with Daisy, I would want to change the 18 to a much healthier amount. So passing parameters to a function, highly recommended method of modifying properties, and that makes now the act of losing weight automated so I can use it on all of my objects that have a weight property. Now Bruno has a method. So Bruno's method here is growl. So the method is when we have a function that is part of a object the term that we use to describe it is method. So we like to call it a method. So Bruno has the growl method. 
So then we can tell Bruno to growl if we so choose. So that's how Mr. Bruno works. And if we want to activate it, then we just bruno.growl and he will growl. That's what Bruno will do. He can growl. Grr. Grr, as he would say. But now I'm not running this and keep refreshing in the browser because I think some of this, when it, all it is is popping up alerts, should be fairly self-explanatory as to what's going on. And you can take the file and do that to your own. And if you are doing that, I do encourage you to comment it out periodically of the things you're not actively looking at to guarantee you're not seeing any overlaps or clashes because sometimes I do have repetitive naming, which depending on what you do or don't comment out could cause problems. But now we're going to move into um, kind of where we left off last week. Uh, let me just comment this out so we're not distracted by that. And this is realizing that the dogs, as they were being created, it was a repetitive activity and it made more sense to have a prototype dog. So the prototype dog then accepts three parameters when we create that instance of our prototype and we can assign its name and its breed and its weight and it has a function inside it. This dot bark equals function so now that dog can bark and while that will work really well so I could say something like Spike is a new dog and we want Spike to be a pit bull and he weighs 22 pounds and then we can tell Spike to bark there's one flaw in this particular method and it was brought up in class last week but I said I would defer talking about that until this week with any length and that flaw is that the bark function is being created as a property of this object. So if I have one dog, I've now created one copy of the bark function. If I have two dogs, it's now going to make two bark functions. But the problem is functions are objects. So we're making our dog object and we're making our bark function object. So for every dog I create, I'm also creating a bark function object. So in this case, if I have 100 dogs, I now have 200 objects. And if my dog isn't limited to just bark, but what if my dog has a sit function and a walk function and a sleep function and an eat function? So if I have a dozen methods that are associated with this dog and I make a hundred dogs, now I have a whole lot more objects than I was intending to create. So I don't just have 100, but I have 1,200 objects. So my 100 dogs becomes 1,200 objects. That's not good. So it, it really, from a writing your code standpoint, where you add the function, we use this dot function name equals function, and then you define out the function, that works really well. It, it makes sense because it's now contained nicely within, so it's all nicely contained within this whole object constructor. But the problem is it makes a new copy of each function as an object as part of every instance. So if we aren't talking about dogs, but say a common thing that we would animate would be particles. We do a particle effect and we have a bunch of methods associated with the particles. We have an update 
method, a display method, we have a collision method, and a, you know when it's time to expire method, and a check boundary method, and we have all these methods, and then I make a thousand particles. And if there's 10 methods, that's 6,000 objects I just, or I mean, um, or however many methods, I don't know, I forgot my math, but you get the point. So putting the methods or the functions inside the object constructor is considered bad form. <laughs> it will work, but what you will find is if you create a lot of objects, you're now unintentionally creating additional objects for every method. And that's not your plan because then you will watch your browser slow down to a crawl and eventually crash. And if you're working on a laptop, you'll be able to see if you keep that tab active in your browser, you'll actually be able to see your battery life going down before your very eyes. You will feel the laptop heating up on your legs and you'll be like, whoa, what's going on? And there's hardly anything going on. But when you start doing some cool graphical effects and we create particles and we do other things and we animate them and they run, if you're not careful with this, you've now created so many objects that it it is really starting to task your CPU. So, bad form. So what I can do is comment that particular item out. And the better way to do it is we take advantage of the fact that every object in JavaScript has a prototype. Think of it as a parent. So every object that is created, it has a parent. An object that <coughs> is kind of of its genetic history, its genetic lineage, that it is responsible to. Um, responsible is not the right word, but tied to. So everything has a prototype. Even the object object has a prototype, and that prototype is effectively the entire document space that's been loaded. So there's the global prototype, and then we kind of work our way down from there. So what you can do is you can say dog.prototype dot function name equals function and then you describe the function. So by doing this you are now assigning this function to kind of the template that the dog object is derived from. So then when we make instances it's not making additional copies of this function because it knows how to do this because it will be baked into its genetics, part of its genetic code history, but it doesn't then construct an additional copy of it. By having the function here, just pull it back out, this, when I make a new dog, it makes a new function object. But when I describe or create that behavior that method and assign it to the prototype of dog then dogs know how to bark but it doesn't make an additional copy of that method because that function is attached to the prototype so to the parent so when the parent knows how to bark the child knows how to bark as well but the child doesn't need to have that method explicitly created with it so it's a little mind-bending sort of it. as I try and explain it it doesn't sound entirely it's a, to me I'm like well I'm confusing myself at times but when we assign something to the parent the child knows how to do what the parent knows how to do but we don't have to then make a new copy of that item that method so that's the that's the gist of what we're after here Defining your method inside your object definition is considered very bad grammar, very bad form. It's a bad practice and you're discouraged from doing so.
That being said, if we go back to the object literal, not the object constructor, if we define the method inside the object here where Bruno knows how to growl, that's not so bad. So because Bruno is one of a kind, he is special that way. We can define this function here because Bruno will only be defined once. I'm not making extra copies of Bruno because he's not a constructor, he is an object. He can now have this function as part of him. But when we define an object constructor, like our dog object, we're essentially creating a prototype dog that we can use to create multiple instances of, and each, each instance is unique. And when we do that, it becomes very important that we define all of our methods using the object.prototype.function name equals function process. So this, oh, wrong button, this line here, this concept, this method is probably one of the most important things to take away from today's lecture. So it's very important that we use object.prototype as our method. And then when we create our uh, instance of dog, then we say var instance name equals new object. And in this case, my object is the dog that I've defined previously. So this is where we use the object or the new, the word new as part of our language. And it's very important. If I don't say new, then it's going to cause me no end of headache. Uh, it's not going to really matter in this particular example, but there are many places where when you have an object constructor function and then you try to create a new instance of that and you forget the word new and then you realize that all the properties you passed into it now change those properties on a global level. So you're now affecting the global document instead of that particular instance. So then that's very bad. So don't forget the word new. That's important when you're creating it. But it, it's, I, I think it's not too hard to remember the word new because you're creating something that's a new instance of that object. So var spike is equal to a new dog being dog is the constructor I want to access. Continuing forward with this, moving away from dogs and into geometry because it's easy to think of some of these things with, um, with basic geometry and math shapes, circles, squares, rectangles, and the like. So if I look at my circle, var circle equals function and when it's created we'll pass into it to our value then say this dot radius equals r and now we're taking this object and assigning to its prototype two separate methods an area method and a circumference method so we can see that I have circle dot prototype dot area equals function and it will return a value so when I use the area method it will return pi times radius times radius which is uh, pi radius squared to give me the area of a circle and if I want the circumference it's 2 pi r so we can see that the circumference function is doing the same thing so the functions aren't returning the same value but they are returning, you know, it's a similar kind of thing where they take our math value of pi and then times it by the correct option that we need. So radius is the property I have created as part of my circle object. I have now used these prototype methods to then assign the, or the prototype technique to assign the method to my object. So now if I create a circle, my circle, if I pass to it when I say var sir equals new circle, 
put a five here, that indicates my circle will have a radius of five. So then if I were to query it and say something like sir dot area and put like this, it would now return the area of the circle. So it would be pi times 25 and whatever that value is. So it's approximately 76 point some, some such nonsense, but we're not going there today. We'll actually see it a little bit later because I will return some of these functions in a little bit. So this is a decent way of constructing our objects. But there is a different way. Now you will notice in the comments I wrote classic method and then we have what's referred to as the newer method. So the classic method where we use prototype, we use the word this, we set it all up. That is a classic standard way that if you go through most code libraries, most code samples that you will find online, you will see that most of those examples use this method. It's the method that's been used pretty much since the beginning of creating new objects. Where we create our object using a constructor and then we can assign methods to the object's prototype and go with it. But a couple things are happening here and that is my constructor function, the primary constructor function, var circle equals function. That constructor function is doing a couple of things behind the scenes. And what it's doing behind the scenes is it's actually working similar to what we see here where within that constructor function it's creating an object and that object is of our named object dot prototype and then it's returning that object after I finish going through this constructor function. So it's actually doing that behind the scenes. So when I use a statement like this, var circle equals function, and then we say this dot property equals whatever parameter I passed in, behind the scenes, it's creating an object for me using object create, and then it's returning that created object and assigning it to my variable. So it's doing that for me and some programmers now are choosing to use the more verbose method using the object create. So instead of using the word this inside their constructor function they actually explicitly name the item. So when we see something similar to the rectangle function and compare it to the circle function, they're essentially doing the same thing except the rectangle is taking two parameters versus one because it has two properties, the length and width versus just a radius. But essentially it's the same thing. But we have two extra lines of code in there to get the identical result. But the rationale for using the newer method is to be more explicit about our intention. Both work equally well. Both perform equally well. Both use memory equally well. But The newer method is more explicit about what you're trying to do. So when you look at the code, you know that this particular function is actually making an object with the intent of it to be a prototype object that you can then make instances of. So it's more verbose in the interest of transparency. But the, at the end of the day, it doesn't 
afford you any other real advantages except for clarity of code. And it does have one disadvantage. Now, I keep maintaining that I am not going to test my code in all browsers, especially old browsers. I'm only going to make sure if it runs in Chrome, I'm considering it good enough for now. The new method works in Chrome, but the new method of using object create does not work in all older browsers. So that can be uh, a problem. There is a little bit of what's referred to as kind of a polyfill or shim code that you can put in that will effectively you use that at the beginning of your script and then if you want to use object create from that point onward it will work in all browsers so there's a little bit of code you can put in the classic method works in all browsers new and old but more programmers are migrating to the object create method because of its transparency of intention because it now shows this constructor function it explicitly shows what it's trying to do it's trying to create an object and after it's run it returns that object so it's it's about kind of it's a good practice it's a recommended way of if you're going to use that and understand the why and how you're using it it really is a better option but if you decide that seeing this more code and now we see you know some words we haven't worked with before object.create and then it's returning this object and you're like whoa I'm all you know I'm all messed up classic method will work just fine and classic method will work in all the older browsers as well so you get to decide based on your use case scenario what is the best, me best method for you now using the object dot create we created our rec uh, we created a variable rectangle inside the rectangle notice they differ by the lowercase and uppercase r's and that's a very common convention when we're doing this and then we set our, that variable's length and width equal to the parameters passed in, we return that rectangle object. Now, if we notice under the circle, when the circle is defined, we have circle prototype dot area equals function, blah, 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 circle dot prototype dot circumference equals function, blah, 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 blah. And under rectangle, it's rectangle dot prototype equals, and now there's some curly braces, and then we've created a list of properties or methods that are going to be I guess methods and define them as properties area and perimeter and attach them to the prototype if you are going to have a number of methods you can use the circle approach where you delineate each one circle that prototype that area equals function curly brace blah 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 or we can do what you see in the rectangle where you do it with just one rectangle dot prototype equals and then you list it out that way they're the same kind of thing it depends on how anal retentive you are about organizing your lines of code or just having the different functions listed but it should be reasonably clear as we've looked at dealing with properties on objects before that specifically last week that defining it this way is not it shouldn't be um, that hard to get through the hard part about this method is remembering that your list of methods you go through your list and you put commas between each one so you have the name of the function colon and then we say function curly brace what it is close curly brace comma except the last one won't get a comma so if we had an additional method here assigned to it then you would put a comma and then it would be other function and then curly brace 
Lure, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I can't think of another operation for my rectangle prototype, so I'll just say that there's an alert and it can do that. And again, then no comma after the last one. So it's a comma delineated list of property value, property value, property value, comma, property value, comma, and the value happens to be functions. So this is a very common way of seeing things, and this is a very common way of seeing things. So as you stumble across other code resources, code libraries, you are going to see these things repeat. Now, I'm um, just going to hide that for now. I think I turned off all the alerts so I won't get a bunch of alerts when I load this page in the browser. But what we're going to do is take a look at uh, some different items here and look at it. I'm going to do this, well, look at these lines one at a time. So if I save it, run this, well, before we save it, looking at console log, it's going to give me circle area plus circle area. So if we look at this, now we will see what it logs out in the console in the browser. So if I reload the page, pull up the console, and you will see it says circle area, and then it told me function, return math pi times circle radius times circle radius. But if we're looking here, some of you may have thought that, well, it should have given me the area of the circle. That would be the logical assumption. And yeah, it would be the logical assumption. But what we said is log out the circle objects area function. That's what I said to log out. I didn't say to run the function. I just said, tell me what that function is. Because when we have a function in JavaScript and we want to activate that function, we need to follow that function with parentheses. So if I say log out circle area plus circle area function, but I want to run the function. So anytime you want to run a function, you put parentheses after it. Otherwise, all it does is assign that function, list that function, but it doesn't actually run the function until you put the parentheses. So putting the parentheses after a function name is when you say go, do whatever you are function, do your magic, give me your worst, or best, or whatever the case may be. Now if I run it, I'll see circle area equals 78.53. So as I said, I was a little bit off on my math there. Um, yeah, that makes more sense, 78, not 76. So there's your circle area when our circle has a radius of 5. So by putting the parentheses after it, it runs it. So to reiterate that, if I just say rectangle perimeter, say log that out, it doesn't run it, it tells me what that function is. So if we reload this, we'll see rectangle perimeter, and then it listed the function, but it didn't run it. If we want to run it, we actually have to put the parentheses after it. And we can see the perimeter of my box is 18. So then it runs it. There's one more method that we can look at where we create our object. And remember, every time we're creating a constructor object, it's recommended we do it with a capital letter. So our instance objects are always lowercase. Our constructor objects will always be uppercase. And that is a convention. And there are some uh, code analyzing uh, resources out there. There are websites that you upload your code into, it goes through your code and it looks for potential errors in your code. And one of the things it does is it looks for functions with capital letters and goes, oh, those are constructor functions. And then it looks for then things that would be lowercase letters and it compares. So it's assuming that every time it's a constructor, you will 
name it with a capital. The same way my circle has a capital on it, my rectangle has a capital, now square has a capital. Now, instead of using prototype function in the same way that we did before, there is a different way of going about it where we do var square and we can say square create equals function, we'll pass a value into it for when it's created, and then s is, I was feeling lazy on the typing instead of a lowercase square I just did s, equals object create and then we throw the word this into it so we're inferring its um, prototype by using the word this then we can set side equal to side and then return that square object that we have then we can give it a method say area and then it has that method that returns a value using that side parameter and then we can create a new object now you'll notice instead of using the word new we're using the word create so instead of var sqr equals new square we use var sqr equals square dot create so we're using the dot create instead of the word new and this then once you have the object created and any parameters assigned to it that you need accessing methods as accessing properties all of that is still done the same so all three object constructions that we've just looked at here classic newer and I guess this would be newest we once we make the object everything is the same it's how we go about making the constructor and creating the instances that varies a little bit otherwise it's pretty much the same so this is the third method the newest method that you can use is using dot create So the only method that will consistently work in all browsers with no extra effort on your part is the classic method where we use, like on our circle example, where we create it and then we use the word this inside of it. But if we create our method and then we create essentially its prototype so this in essence is writing its prototype function where it returns the object assigning methods to it that and the other prototype method are using object create are not going to necessarily work in all browsers without some additional effort on your part but it, they will work in all of the modern browsers uh, the most common feeling browser is of course our ubiquitous old versions of IE Otherwise, uh, the other ones have kept up and are more open to these techniques uh, far sooner. But all of these are methods we can use to construct objects. <coughs> we will, will use to construct objects, but we will probably be focusing most frequently on either using the classic method or the newer method with object create here where it creates the object and returns it, which the third method is very similar to it, but it's a little bit different. Depending on how you structure your code, what objects you, you are creating, how many objects you need to create, the third method can be a little bit more advantageous in terms of organizing of your code because you can define the variables in one place than all of your constructors somewhere else. So you can have things nicely organized and have a good, easy to follow flow of code. So depending, I mean, so much of what we do is all case dependent. So you need to decide who is your audience, what is their technology, what do I need to support, how do I want to go about it, what level of complexity are you comfortable with, and then make your decision accordingly. If you use the classic method, that will work. It's just not quite as transparent about what it's actually doing. That constructor function doesn't really say, hey, by the way, I just created a new object. But if we look at the other method, it's object create. So it's pretty clear that we are making an object. So when we see this function, 
we know right away that that is indeed what it is doing. So from that standpoint, it would be preferred, but we just have to be aware of its potential shortcomings.